everybody. Um, my name is Ramona Nicholas, and I'm here with my uh, fellow colleagues, uh, Dr. Catherine Patton and Dr. Neha Gupta, and um, Dr. Blair is not here today. So we are pleased to be involved in this discussion. As uh, we come as part of a larger research collective from Canada, where we work on understandings of the past. Could you just speak now? Okay. <coughs> That's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> We are pleased to be involved in this discussion. We come as a part of a larger research collective from Canada where we work on understandings of the past that emerge from the area between Western and Indigenous knowledge systems, exploring the ways in which different archaeological understandings can grow from different intellectual traditions and systems of thought. Our scholarship is, is informed by insights of academic scholars like Sonia Adelaide, who envision the braiding together of knowledge systems a lovely image of intact but multi-stranded intellectual streams flowing in and around each other. In similar way, David Newhouse employs the metaphor Guswenda space, this white space between two rows on a wampum belt to signify ways of knowing that are separate, with the space between being a place of respect and understanding. Finally, the Mi'kmaq elder, Albert Marshall, calls on us to seek a harmonizing of Western indigenous knowledge to the metaphor of two wide seam, which in a profoundly gracious and generous way, encourage us to bring together the mindful of insights from both ways of knowing. What all of these scholars are grappling with is the underlying epistemology that informs how we know what we know and not just what we know. This thinking examines the powerful impact of cultural and language <clears throat> on how we construct meaning in the world and is profoundly philosophical discussion. However, today we emphasize what we, have been, what we have known for decades, that these debates are influenced by social and political factors. As suggested by Bruce Trigger, telling stories about the past is frequently about constructing narratives that justify the present and indicate core ideas of merit, authenticity, and justice. Thus, these are fun also fundamentally stories about the interweaving of knowledge, space, and power. We have been asked to contemplate particular questions about archaeologists as public intellect intellectuals. The importance of an archaeological perspective as a means to combat racism and xenophobia and the balancing acknowledgement of past and present wrongs with creating a critical engaged present. These are important things for us to aspire to. However, they reflect a post-colonial view that attempts to reconcile ourselves with past wrong to enable us to achieve a state of reconciliation. While it is hopeful to think that we will someday achieve a post-colonial condition, we are simply not there yet. It is true that many of us live in parts of the world that, no lo that are no longer under col colonial administration. However, we argue that colonialism is not simply a set of political and economic relationships involving direct control over dependent territories. Nations like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand have long since moved past colonial status in the sense of the word. However, a broader definition of colonialism views it as a practice of domination of European descendants over non-Western peoples as reflected in the creation of super, supranational organizations in the aftermath of the Second World War. In this sense, we will argue many former colonies can be thought of as quasi-colonial states. Therefore, in many parts of the world that have been strongly impacted by colonialism, archaeologists first must contribute to facilitating awareness of powerful structures of knowledge making that were born in the colonial era, and then work toward demolishing problematic contemporary policies and laws that take ownership of the past away from indigenous people. Practices that are reified and perpetuated by interests within government and within capitalist private sector enterprises that would block their dismantling. In Canada, there are 634 recognized First Nations a term used in Canada to describe Aboriginal people who are not Métis or Inuit. In a nation of over 30 million people, more than 1.5 million are identified as being First Nations of First Nations heritage. 
These recognized First Nations are not independent states within Canada, and they incorporate a range of ethnicities and historical social, social political entities, speaking at least 50 distinct languages. The term First Nation can come, has come to be used to refer to what, we are, what were original reservations, small patches of land covered out of, carved out of comprehensive traditional territories where status Indians could reside and be managed by the state while being isolated from the resources, rights, and privileges of non-Indigenous people in Canada. The Indian Act of Canada is the principal legislative tool used by the federal government of Canada to establish the category of Indian as a federally recognized status to manage the government's governance of a myriad of First Nations governments within Canada and to establish a set of rights and privileges for people who are deemed based on federally accepted criteria in the Indian Act to be Indian. The Act was first introduced in 1876 seven years after the creation of the Canadian Confederation and con consolidated a series of previous colonial ordinances which had the express purpose of eradicating First Nations culture and assimilating First Nations people into Euro-Canadian society. In effect, the Indian Act served to homogenize colonial practices and entrench paternalism into federal legislation. As an Indigenous person living under this Act, I can tell you about the impact of my everyday life of this legislation. It does not feel post-colonial, and in many contexts where archaeology is practiced in the world, colonial views are entrenched and embedded within current, comprehensive archaeological and heritage legislation. They impact the way in which archaeological fieldwork is carried out, how and by whom, as well as the way that archaeological archaeological data are managed, curated, and how indigenous cultural heritage is preserved. Interpretation of archaeology is influenced by contemporary values and beliefs about indigenous people and the nature of things. This context shapes international archaeology in critical ways. In Canada, the Indian Act is a federal instrument, whereas archaeological work is overseen by provincial governments. Typically, the regulation of archaeology is carried out vis-a-vis -vis legislation to protect artifacts and sites of archaeological interest that might be impacted by large-scale large construction projects. The province is not only mere federal legislation, but often extend the colonial framework into provincial legislation that protects jobs, ensuring, <clears throat> thereby ensuring votes and the interests of powerful industrial lobbyists. Our case study is from the region in which we work and the unceded, unsurrendered ter traditional territory of my people, the Willis de Guig. This territory has been carved into contemporary geopolitical jurisdictions, including the American state of Maine <coughs> the Canadian, and the Canadian provinces of New Brunswick and Quebec. That said, most of the Willis de Guig territory falls under the provincial rule of New Brunswick, so we will focus on that context in our discussion. In 2009, the government of New Brunswick updated the laws that oversees archaeological work by creating the Heritage Conservation Act, which assumes that Willis de Guy cannot manage archaeological information and their own heritage, effectively taking away the opportunity to create knowledge about our ancestors. This is the violence of colonialism, colonialism in contemporary New Brunswick. The term heritage has become an overarching term that encompasses objects, monuments, sacred sites, and archaeological places, and can include intangible facets such as social practices and collective memory. Heritage means that which may be inherited. It derives from an old French word that gives us the concept of heir, inheritance, ancestral estate, heirloom, and inherit. Increasingly, the Indian Act expressly intervenes in, in Excuse me. The Indian Act expressly intervenes in inheritance for status Indians and retains the power to overturn wills and allocate intergenerational transmission of goods from one person to another without considering relatedness or personal wishes. The power to take inheritance away from indigenous communities is further reflected in the concepts embedded in the core of the New Brunswick Heritage Conservation Act. For example, in section five, subsection one states, the property and the title and the rights of, and possession to an archeological object, paleontology, paleontological object, 
or burial object discovered in the province after the commencement of this section is invested in the crown. Furthermore, subsection five or section five, subsection three states, an archeological object or burial, burial object for which the property has vested in the crown under subsection one shall be held in trust for the Aboriginal peoples of the province if A, it is in possession of the minister and B, it is identified identified by the minister as being of Aboriginal origin. <clears throat> the role of Crown in this case represented by the people is clearly retained a colonial patronal <laughs> um, is clearly retain, retaining a colonial patronalistic relationship with Indigenous peoples in Canada as it retains the power to assign or withhold the right to do to, do, to undertake field-based research to study collections and obtain an information about the past. The province has used its power to distance information about our own ancestors from First Nations people, some of whom, like me, are permittable archeologists under provincial legislation. This session calls on us correctly, we believe, to adopt a rational voice in support of contemporary cultural diversity based on respect for the past. However, it is critically important that it is not just a feel-good exercise that promotes our discipline, but one that brings us fully into conflict with the state that for, and that forces with the state and forces that shape contemporary society. An earlier notion of inherent means condition or state transmitted from ancestors and is entirely consistent with the teachings I received from elders and through them, my ancestors. However, it requires us to be intentional and explicit in our notions of heritage and to recognize the complex contemporary relationships of power and law that seek to shape it. Thank you.